I, uh, I'm excited to, to preach and, and teach uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, God put a message in my heart that I think is going to be, um, I think it's going to benefit all of us, but uh, I think it's going to be pretty relevant to, um, to just our, our culture, especially as the majority of us, you know, um, or many of us, I should say, of uh, uh, Latino men in this country where we are, well, there are so many where they get to this country and see so much opportunity and so many things. And it's like, I just want to work. I just want to get, make some money. I just want to the American dream. Right. So um, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and the idea behind this is to be instructive, educational and not to be cond condemning or or um, or none of that stuff. But but I think it's going to be a, a great blessing for all of us. Um, so, again, happy Father's Day. I want to say personally that being a father the short time that I've been a dad has been the best for me. It's literally the best thing I've ever done, and I didn't do that much, right? Like, uh, I didn't do that much to uh, to to become a father. Um, I'm so grateful for my wife and for my family, and and being a father really has been one of the most rewarding experiences that I have um, ever had, and that I'm having, and that I get to partake and participate in. And at the same time, is the most challenging thing that I do, right? As a father, it's a, it's a challenge knowing that my son looks at my every move. He follows me around. He constantly wants to be with me. And he does everything that I do. And, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's awesome. It's awesome, you know, when I, when I get it right, right? And I'm like, man, my kid is just going to be just like me. And he's going to follow Christ. But then other times when I'm feeling guilty and I'm feeling bad, I'm like, oh, crap, he's going to be just like me. And I don't want him to. Right. So uh, so it's it's again um, the, the most rewarding and at the same time, the most challenging thing. And, and being a father, just like being a mother, uh, unfortunately, there is no owner's manual. Right. There's no directions. And, and some people say, well, the Bible, we can go to the Bible for advice. We can go to the Bible to know what to do. And, uh, and it's true, and we can, and there is a lot of important principles and truths that we can lift out of the Bible, and that's why we gather week after week, so that we can grow in our relationship with God, in our relationship with others, and just be better um, followers of Christ and His representatives. Um, but the truth of the matter is that even in the Bible, there's not great examples of parents, right? You can think of any biblical character and uh, that character was e either had or was a jacked up dad, right? Like, I mean, there's just bad examples and bad fathers all throughout the scriptures. Even Mary and Joseph. Joseph left Jesus in Jerusalem one time. Like, home alone in the Bible, three days, Jesus alone, right? It's like, I mean, even Joseph, right? Um, so so there's not a lot of ex good examples in in the Bible, as a matter of fact, there's only one father in the Bible that is perfect, right? And that is God. God is the only perfect father, and even his first two children rebelled against him, right? So even if you do everything right as a father, as a parent, there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees that our children may go astray or whatever. I mean, sure, there's there's, there's more probability. Um, there's better... Um, you know, chances they might do all right. But the, the truth of the matter is that, man, um, there's there's just no 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 certainties. Right. And uh, and what what as a result, there's just a lot of pressure, pressure that we put on ourselves as fathers, but also pressure that society kind of puts also on the role of a father, role, you know, pressure that says, well, as a dad, well, you should be this, or as a husband, you should be that, or or by this age, you should have accomplished this, or you should have that, or or by this time in your career, you should be here, right? And there's just all these pressures that unfortunately cause a lot of men, a lot of family men to live in this constant rat race, in this constant race to keep up with this ambiguous and random um, you know, just ridiculous demands and expectations that that really we're either putting on ourselves or we think society expects of us. And, and, and at more times than not, we end up sacrificing our families, sacrificing our relationship with others, and in many cases, sacrificing our relationship with God. So today, 
I want to uh, continue with our series titled The Life You've Always Wanted. And, um, you know, we are studying the uh, one of the most popular portions of Scripture, Psalm 23, right? Um, and uh, in Psalm 23, we have a perfect picture of the goodness of God. And within that song, we also see the, the antidote for the nine, um, you know, the nine greatest sources of stress in our life. Now, speaking about fathers, I found this chart that, um, that I wanted to share with you guys. This is a survey done by LifeWay Research, you know, talking about men living in a rat race and, and living, trying to keep up with these expectations, that society or whatever. Um, LifeWay did a survey with a thousand different evangelical pastors, and they asked them about attendance, Sunday attendance, and some of the, the highest attendance and lowest attendance Sundays throughout the year and you guessed it top of the chart highest attendance throughout the year is resurrection sunday easter then christmas and then mother's day right which is a big sunday and we we've seen it here we've seen that those days man we get families and we get a good little crowd or whatever um but um but then throughout the rest of the year you know sometimes churches do a homecoming you know kind of like rededicate your life or bring a friend day or whatever um, but look at that, 4th of July, hey, I'm going to the lake, I'm going to go grill out, I'm going to go to the park, I'm doing something, church, what? Right? And then Father's Day is down there in the list. And so this is statistically proven that, uh, that this is a constant battle that we are in, and it's something that it's important for us to talk about, right? Because again, there's so much pressure on the role of the father that it, it can affect our families, it can affect our relationships. It can affect, and it does definitely affect our relationship with God. So today, we are going to go to verse 2 on Psalm 23, because we're going to study this verse by verse. We're on the second week of this series. And verse 2 in Psalm 23 says that God, right, we spoke last week, that He is my shepherd. I have everything that I need, or I lack nothing, right? And then it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. Now, the image, and it's easy, you know, because the psalmist paints such a beautiful picture, but it's easy to, to kind of visualize this, right? He makes me lie down where? In green pastures. We can visualize that. He leads me how, where? Besides quiet waters. So the image of this verse is that of rest and refreshment. Rest and refreshment all right so to start today and and um like every single week i want to share with you today's message in a sentence so this is the point where i give you one thought or one idea so that if you don't remember anything else um you know i want you to remember this and i actually have two sentences so there's a bonus today right so the first one is that I want you to walk out here remembering, if somebody asks you, hey, what did you learn in church today? You can say, well, I learned that the difference between being blessed and being stressed is often rest. All right? The difference, and it rhymes, so you should remember. The difference between being blessed and being stressed is often rest. Right? Now, the second one, if that's, you know, that's... Bar City, let me give you a JV, right? So let me give you a second kind of sentence. And it's this idea that to give God my best requires rest. And you can even substitute God there by, hey, if I want to give my family my best, it really does require rest. If I want to give my best to my career, to my job, to my position, to my studies, to my friendships, to whatever it is, if I want to give the best of me, it really does require us to rest. Because I don't know how many of you have experience where you're just kind of tired and you're, you're just kind of snippy, right? Like you just... You know, you jump back and you and it's because, hey, you need to chill. You need to relax. You need time to rest. So with that in mind, let us pray so that then we, we can uh, continue with our study today. Amen. Oramos. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Psalm 23, this famous and beautiful song, God, that teaches you and that shows us 
God, how good you are. God, I pray today, like every single week, that what I share here today are not just simply my words, my thoughts, or my ideas. But God, I pray that you will speak to your people in your church so that we can have a personal encounter with the living Christ. God, speak to us clearly, personally, and powerfully in such a way, God, that we will leave this place different than how we came in. And God, I pray all these things and I do it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right. So there's a lot of blanks on your paper if you don't have an outline to take notes. Uh, the first five, we're going to go pretty quick. And then we're finished with the last five. So I'm going to give you first five reasons why people overwork. Five reasons why people don't rest. Five reasons why we have a hard time, you know, living in this rat race, you know, falling into the traps of culture and society. Uh, and then I'm going to finish by giving you the five antidotes that as followers of Christ, we can battle this so that we can live more balanced lives, right? Last week we spoke about how God is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I don't have to worry. It's a life of sustenance. God wants to give us everything that we need or he can and he does. Um, but today we want to talk about how do we live a more balanced life, right? Um, because a lot of times we're, we're a lot, you know, we're, we're either cleaning one way or the other. We're, we're at the office or we're at work or we're at projects, but then stuff starts, you know, falling behind at home. So then we go home and then we start falling behind. So we want to be balanced, right? So this is five reasons why people overwork. Number one is misplaced identity, misplaced identity. And this is the idea of, of those that base their worth, no, basing my worth on my work, right? Um, this is where people confuse their self-worth with their net worth, right? Or their value for their valuables, right? There's a confusion of identity there. And um, there's, this, there's this verse in Ecclesiastes 10 that says that fools wear themselves out right to the point where they don't know enough to find their way home and hey the, the, god said that uh, you know this is this is the the wisest man on earth right this is uh, uh solomon solomon uh who wrote ecclesiastes so he says hey it's foolish to work so hard that you wear yourselves out and, and you're not even wise enough to take care of things at home. Work is a part of life. It's not all of our lives, right? But when we miss, um, when we, when we miss our identity and we, we misplace our identity, we, we, we put, you know, all our energy, all our time, all our resources into the wrong place. So that's the first reason why some people would work, right? Be, basing my worth on my work, misplaced identity. Number two, is materialism, right? It's wanting more things. And, and at one time or another, we've all fallen trapped to this, or sometimes we, we desire other things and want more things. Nothing wrong with that. It's the problem when things have us, right? And Proverbs um, 23, verses 4 and 5 says, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. For it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. It is important for us, and we spoke about this last week, for us not to base our identity on things that we can lose, right? It's so easy for us to base our identity on my role and my position and in, in my status, right? In my positions, in my socioeconomic you know, level or social um, you know, uh, education level or whatever, but we can lose those things. We can lose our job. We can lose our roles. We can lose our money. And I think our founding fathers, the founding fathers of this country, they knew this verse pretty well. That's why they put an eagle in every dollar bill that you ever see, right? Because it can fly away as, as easy as you got it. It can also go away. And um, I, I, I read this. Um, that is, uh, it's, it's so powerful. But it says so many people spend the first half of their life, the first half of their life, sacrificing their health, overworking in order to get wealth, right? So they sacrifice their health, overworking in order to get wealth, 
And then they have to, on the second half of their life, they have to sacrifice their wealth in order to try to get healthy again, right? So we have to find a better way. We have to find a more balanced way for us to live. Now, Luke um, 12, 15 says, beware against every kind of of greed, right? Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own, right? Life's not measured by how much stuff you have. Now, I want to call your attention to this verse because it says, beware and guard yourself against every kind of greed, all kinds of greed, meaning that there's not just one type of greed, right? You know, some people have house greed. Other people have car greed, right? Other people have gadget greed, like Apple greed, right? Other people have clothes greed or shoes greed or, or vacation or food or nice restaurant greed. Like that's your thing. That's, that's what you spend your money on. That's what you think about or whatever. Um, and, um, and you know, so it's important for us to know that greed is not just one thing. It's, it, it comes in different in many different forms and we have to guard ourselves of that greed that, that you know, we, we just want more and I'm not happy with what I have. I want other things. Now, you might be here today and you say, well, you know, I don't have a problem with greed. I don't spend money. I, I save money. I'm a, I'm a saver, not a spender. Okay. Well, then that's also another type of greed because then you are trusting on your money and your savings and your dedication to supply for your need instead of trusting in the Lord. So that's savings account greed. So beware of all kinds of greed because it's, it's not easy to see greed in, um, in, the, in the mirror, right? So materialism is another reason why so many people are worried. Number three, envy, right? Wanting to be like others. Wanting to be like others. Trying to keep up with our friends with our neighbors, right? Well, they bought a new car. Well, hey, honey, I think it's time for us to get a new car. They went, we're on vacation. Hey, I think it's time for us to plan a vacation. And if it could be nicer than where they went, that would be awesome. So I can post the pictures, right? And all this, right? Or their kids are involved in five extracurricular activities and our kids have to be involved in five extracurricular activities, right? Or, or, or oh, look at all, the, man, they're always on social media and look at all the pictures they post. So I have to be on social media and I have to post, you know, stuff all the time. And envy drives so many people to just be busy, busy on stuff that really is not producing much. But again, Solomon is so wise. And in Solomon 4.4, 4, he noticed this thousands of years ago. This verse is so powerful. It says, why do people work so hard? I saw people try to succeed and be better than other people. They, they, they do this because they're jealous. They don't want other people to have more than they have. This is senseless. It is like trying to catch the wind, right? There's always going to be someone with more than us, right? So it's impossible to for this comparison game. We're always going to come out losing because we're either going to be prideful when we have more than others or we're going to be, right, unsatisfied and we're going to be, right, and un ungrateful for what we have when we have less than other people. So envy is another reason. Number four is because of misaligned values. Misaligned values when we when we value achievements more than relationships, right? When we value achievements more than relationships, and and this is unfortunate, but we've all either seen or we know or we've heard of people that they have walked away from their families, they have walked away from marriages, they have walked away from from relationships, from friendships, right? They sacrifice relationships for their job, for their position, for money, for power, for status, or whatever it is, right? Some people, they sacrifice their families, they sacrifice being a good parent, a good present father, you know, parent, and just being there, or, or just, they sacrifice just being a good friend, right? So, so many people sacrifice so much because of misaligned values, and, and again, Ecclesiastes 4, 7 and 8, 8 says, again, I saw something else that didn't make sense, says Solomon. I saw a man who has no family, not a son or even a brother, 
Again, no relationships, right? But he continues to work very hard. He's never satisfied with what he has. And he works so hard that he never stops to ask himself, listen to this. Why am I working so hard? Why don't I let myself enjoy life? This is also a very bad and senseless thing. So, man, God did not put us on earth for us to work our whole life, for us to make a lot of money, to buy a big house, to buy a lot of cool stuff. That's not why we're here on earth. God put us on this earth so we could learn to love, right? That's how people will know we're followers of Christ, but how we love one another, right? And we cannot learn to love if we don't have real relationships with other people, right? So when we get to heaven one day, if you're a follower of Christ, when we get to heaven, God's not going to say, all right, well, tell me your goals and let me and tell me if you achieve them, right? Give me a check mark. No, he's going to say, tell me about your relationships. Did you get to know me? Did you get to know my son, right? Did, did you get to know, um, right, do you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, right? How about other people? Did you serve other people? Did you love the people in your life? So misaligned values. When we, when we have that unbalanced life, it, it creates us to, to live in this rat race, chasing things. And number five is because of... Um, um, I forgot that half of the, why, why am I working so hard? Have we asked ourselves, what, why am I working so hard? Number five um, is because of insecurity. Insecurity, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I won't have enough. I'm afraid that I just won't have enough, right? Um, the Bible teaches us clearly in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So notice, it's not money that's evil. Money is neutral. We can use it for good or use it for bad. So it's not money that is the root of evil. No, it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, this is the place where many people would say, well, I mean, I don't love money. Like, I just, I just don't see myself there. And that's, and that's, if that's fair, maybe you, you do. You don't see yourself there. But I would ask you then, well, how much money... Do you think you would need to feel secure, right? How much money do you think you need to feel secure? I don't care how much money, how little money or how much money. I think all of us could agree that we probably say, well, I mean, probably just a little bit more, right? I mean, I'm good, but like a little more, like I'd be good, right? Like I would feel that I would have more peace or whatever. And I mean, it's a trick question because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, 10, 5, 10, that those who love money, what does it say? We're never satisfied with the money that we have, right? Those that love money will never be satisfied with the money they have. Those who love wealth will not be satisfied when they get more and more. This is so senseless. I, I, um, I watched this interview um, with these different um, very wealthy men, like millionaires, like billionaires, right? And they ask the question, well, how much, how much more money do you need like to feel secure? And these guys like straight face, like for real, serious. They were, um, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 million more, right? And it's like, they don't know that when they get that money, it's still not gonna be enough. I don't know how many of you have seen a movie called All the Money in the World. I, I rented it and I, I, um, I, I didn't finish it. I started watching it. But it's a true story of, a, um, of the kidnapping of a guy named Paul Getty, which was the grandson of one of the richest men in the 1970s, in, I think in England somewhere. Um, and um, they, they, they kidnapped the, the grandson in order to get money from the grandparent who was a, a billionaire, right? He had made his money from the oil industry and the kidnappers asked for a ransom of $17 million. I mean, that's a lot of money, right? It's a lot of money. Um, but his grandpa, who was a millionaire, like I said, he earned his fortune in the oil industry. Industry, He didn't want to pay. He didn't pay. If you've seen the money, you know, he, didn't, he didn't pay. He, 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 uh, he um, 
negocio, right? Like he, he uh, bartered with them at the end. But, uh, but the reason why he didn't pay is because at the time, there was an oil crisis in 1973. There was an oil crisis. And he thought, if I pay this money, I may not have enough. I may not have enough for, for, my, for my house, my employees, my company or whatever, right? And this is a billionaire talking. And Psalm 127.2 says, it is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing you will starve to death. Fearing that you will not have enough. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Their proper rest. So, men, today um, we, we want to talk about five principles for us to live a more balanced life life. You know, we talk about some of the reasons why why we feel like we just can't rest or we're constantly wanting more or living in the rat race trying to compete with others or the demands or the, the pressure that we feel and, and we're living lives that we're just man, we're just tired, right? And and I, I wrote here, man, for, for some of us, for many of you, the godliest thing you can do, the most spiritual thing you could do this week is not memorize Romans eight. That would be great. But for many of you, right, just just take a nap, right, and not feel guilty about it. Just go out to eat with your family, with your friends, and enjoy time, not having to look at the time on your phone because of your to-dos, because of everything else. The, the, the most spiritual thing you can do is, and, and I don't want to blaspheme here, but you could leave the house dirty for another day and just rest and go for a walk and spend time with God in silence, right? That's the most spiritual thing that you can do and literally rest. So um, with some of these antidotes we want to talk about now to finish, we have a, a few minutes left. Yeah, we'll, we'll finish on time. Um, so five principles, and, and these are going to go ahead and go, you know, hand on hand with, with the five reasons why we overwork. So number one is remember my value to God. Right? We talked about misplaced identity. Well, we have to remember our value to God. Remember our value to God. And this is so, so opposite to our culture, right? This is completely countercultural because um, in our culture, we base so much of our identity in what we do, right? I mean, if you pay attention to your conversation with anybody that you're just meeting, one of the first questions that you ask is, oh, and what do you do for a living, right? But it, because it's, it's such a big part of our lives. I mean, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, that's what, that's what we do, right? So it's a big part of our lives. But, but if we want to live a more balanced life, we have to remember that my value doesn't come from what I do, but who I belong to, right? So how valuable are we? How valuable are we? Well, God made you right god made us so and god doesn't make junk god doesn't make junk right god doesn't make anything without purpose god doesn't make anything without intention so that's a big deal right there god made you second jesus died for you that's a pretty big deal his one and only son gave his life for us and number three is that he put his Holy Spirit in us. We are a temple of his Holy Spirit. How valuable are we to God? Pretty valuable. I mean, if I were to ask you, well, how valuable are your kids to you? How much, like, like for real, like how much could I pay you for one of your kids, right? Like, it's nuts. Well, some, no, no, don't ask, don't be too serious, right? Be like, 20 million, I'll think I'll get no. But like, uh, you know, like how you, we, without thinking about it, my children are priceless. My son is priceless to me, but not because of what he does, but because he's mine. Amen. Because he's mine. I, I met, made that right with my wife. So, so he is mine. So again, it's not what I do that gives me value, but who I belong to. And we need to know that we need to remember that when we're in this right, why am I working so hard? Why, why am I trying? Well, who am I trying to impress? My value is not from what I do, how much money I make or how many people say ooh and ah about the things that I have. No, my value is not because of what I do or what I have, but who 
I belong to. Now, there's people, there's people here that maybe in, in some moment in your life, somebody told you that you're not good enough or why aren't you more like your brother or your sister or, or why can't you just or this and the other. And, and unconsciously, you have filed that in the back of your mind and you're trying to, to live in your life like I'll show them. I'll show them I'm going to get to the highest top. I'm going to make the most money so that they look and they'll say, whoa, right? So that I, I'll, I'll, I'll show them. And you're living in this rat race. But the truth of the matter is that, man, if you're in Christ, you don't have to show your worth. You don't have to show your worth to other people because God showed us our worth when Jesus died on the cross. Amen. Ephesians 1, 7. Listen to the power in this verse. He, meaning God, is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with what? With the blood of his son and forgave our sins. That is your value. That's how much you're valuable in the eyes of the Lord. So remember my value to God. Number two, when we're talking about materialism, the, the antidote is to enjoy what I already have. To enjoy what I already have. This is called contentment, right? This is called contentment. I am, um, <laughs> you know, I go, I go to the to the store, Target, Walmart, and different things with my son, and and we always walk the toys, the toy aisles, and and he's like, buy me, I want this, and buy me this, and buy me that, and I'm like, you know, I, what I want to do one day is just take a camera around the house. And take pictures of all his toys and make like a book, like a little catalog. And one day just like show him, it's like, oh, I want that. It's like, yeah, you got that. It's right over there, right? You don't play with it anymore, right? You don't even, right? Because he's like, oh, I want this. I'm like, you got one of those at home already, right? So I found this awesome, this awesome quote that says, once you need less, you will have more. Once you need less, you will have more. And this is, this is actually pretty profound and pretty deep and biblical, I believe. Philippians um, chapter 4, verse 12 says, this is Paul speaking. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or a little. What is that? That's contentment, Right. Is contentment. And I, and I want you to notice that it says, I have learned this. This is not natural. This is not, this is, this is very unnatural, right? On that, naturally, we're very discontent people, but I am convinced, I'm convinced that when God, when God looks down on us and when he sees people that are, that are grateful, that are content, that are using what they have to bless others, to be a means of blessing for his glory, right? I believe that God blesses those people more than others, right? I, I, I've said this before and I'll repeat it. I said, I've said that if God can get a blessing through you, then he'll get a blessing to you, right? Because he knows that that blessing, that increase in salary, that position, that role is not going to be a stumbling block for you. It's, gonna, it's not going to fill you up with pride and I'm more than others. No, no, no. If God can get a blessing through you, that he will get a blessing to you. So again, look, I don't say all this to, to say that, that having nice things is wrong. No, God wants great things for you, right? That the problem was when, when nice things have us, right? It's not, there's not wrong to have nice things. Hey, have a good job, have a nice car, have a good home, right? But you can have them in your hand, but they're just not in your heart. Because God is there. He is first, right? And when God sees that, I believe that he blesses those people. Listen to what um, Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says. It says, a little food eaten in peace is better than twice as much earned from overwork and chasing the wind. It's better to have a little with contentment, with happiness, with joy, with 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 harmony in the in the home, with a with a relationship with your family, with your kids, with your wife, than having twice as much and living in this constant rat race where you just you cannot rest. That's wisdom. That's wisdom right there. So now some people say, well, 
once I have more, once I, once I have more, then I'll be generous, then I'll help others, then I'll do this. But man, the truth is, is that money and, and possessions, they're really what they are, are a magnifier, are they not? The money and possessions are a magnifier. Like if you're generous with what you have now, once you have more, you're gonna be even more generous. But if you're stingy and if you're cheap with what you have now, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you're still, you're actually gonna be more stingy and more cheap, right? And this is statistically proven that people with lots and lots of money, actually percentage wise, they give so much less than people that have not even a significant amount, you know, compared to. So um, money is a, is a magnifier. So man, we need to enjoy what we have with contentment, with gratitude for his glory. And I believe that God blesses those people more because he knows that those blessings are not a stumbling block. Number um, number three is very, very practical. It's just, man, to limit our work to six days a week. Limit my work to six days a week. Now, if you're not doing this, I mean, you might say, Aníbal, I don't, I don't kill, I don't steal, like I'm faithful to my wife, I, I mean, I'm good. But if you're not taking at least one day off a week, you're still breaking the Ten Commandments. I mean, this is how serious this is to God. Exodus 9, 10, God says, you have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day, right? Of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. That word Sabbath means day of rest. Now, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, why is rest such a big deal to God? If you read the scriptures, rest is a big portion of the, the teachings of God to, to Israel. And even Jesus, he spoke about the importance of Rest and uh, and this was I mean like Jesus I mean God was super serious about this like the the people of Israel they they had to work only six days and take a day off because if not they would literally die like they would just fall dead in the spot and the reason is because in the eyes of God rest it really is synonymous with trust rest is synonymous with trust resting is 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 the, kind of the same of trusting and and depending on god now the israelites not only had to take a sabbath but if you study it you know that um they had to give 10 percent of everything they produce all the agriculture all their crops they had to give 10 percent to god and take a day off so they were only living on 90 percent of what they made and only six days a week when other nations, they got to keep 100% of what they made and they got to work seven days a week if they wanted to, right? But God, this was God's way of showing the world, right? That my nation with six days a week and 90%, they're gonna be even more blessed. If they do things my way, they're gonna be even more blessed than those nations that have 100% and, and seven days a week because I wanna show the world that I am God, that I am great and that I am good to my kids. Right. So Psalm, this is one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 121 verses one through four says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And this is important because the people that can't rest or the people that feel guilty when you're resting are the people that that think that everything just relies on me. Like I have to get everything done. I, everything depends on me. But when you take a day off, when you're able to rest, when you're able to enjoy your friends, your family, when you can take a nap, when you can do whatever it is, basically what you're doing is, hey, my help comes from the Lord. And while I'm resting, he that does not sleep, he that does not slumber, I'm trusting in him. I'm depending in him. So, so what do we do? What do we do in our day of rest? Well, very practically, first, we want to rest our body. It's important for you to rest 
your body, this is medically proven. Our biology actually has a seven day cycle where um, doctors actually say that our heartbeat actually beats different every seventh day. So we were created for a day of rest. So we rest our body. Number two, we, we recharge our emotions. We recharge our emotions, and this is different for everybody. I mean, some people might recharge by, by reading a book or going for a walk or just, you know, sitting down with family or, or eating a good meal with, with friends or, or, you know, going for a run or whatever. I don't know. Whatever recharges you, your emotions so that you're emotionally capable during the week and everything, that's important to do. And then number three is important for us to refocus our spirit. And this is the importance of worship. This is the importance of gatherings like this one where we can, we can all come under the teaching and under the word of God to be realigned, to be refocused in our relationship with God. Now, the powerful thing about this is, and this is so powerful, the powerful thing about this is that if we apply these things, if we honor God in doing these things God's ways, we actually get more time. We actually literally get more time. The Bible teaches in the Proverbs that the beginnings of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is what? Is fear of the Lord. When we fear the Lord, when we, when we acknowledge His sovereignty, when we, when, we, when we know that He's God, when we respect Him, when we honor Him, fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now look at this verse. This is so powerful in Proverbs 9, 11. It says, Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. You want more time? You want to be more wise with your time? Fear the Lord is what you get wisdom. And wisdom will let us know where, where do I need to be investing all my energy, all my time, all my emotions, all this and the other. And we'll actually get more time. This is, this is the word of God. So number four. Number four is adjust my values we talked about misaligned values so in this point very brief and very i want to say blunt but it's the truth we have to ask ourselves hey what's really important what is really important to me what are the things that are important the balance in my bank account what is important what do i consider valuable because you can say that something is important to you but really is your lifestyle and is your life what shows what you really do value so adjust, take, take inventory, take, you know, examine your values. What is it that is important to you? The Bible tells us in Mark 8, verse 36, what do you benefit? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but lose your soul? What, what, what gain? What, what benefit is there, right? I mean, some, some people, some people might be impressed with your salary, or your position, or your authority, your influence, your car, your house. They might be impressed with the pictures that you put on social media. But let me, let me assure you that God is not impressed. God is more interested in your soul. How is your soul? How is your soul? How are your relationships? How is your relationship with God? When was the last time that you spent significant time with God, have you ever? Have you ever just fallen on your face, inside it, with tears, with you know, like whatever? When has it been? How long has it been? Have you ever? How are your relationships? God is not impressed. He is more interested in our soul. And number five, and to finish today, number five is for us to exchange our restlessness for God's peace. For us to exchange our restlessness for God's peace. Now, there are different types of fatigue, right? There's physical fatigue, obviously. But there's also emotional fatigue and, and spiritual fatigue. Now, I can assure you that you need more than sleep uh, to take care of those last two. But to take care of emotional fatigue and spiritual fatigue, you need more than just a nap, right? Some people say, well, I just, I just need a vacation. And you might, and that's good. 
I mean, I need one, right? Like, I mean, you might need a vacation, and that and that is true. Um, but but man, how many of us have come from come home from vacation, and we need a vacation from our vacation, right? And that's and for some of us, we're just tired or whatever because of the time of vacation. But but some people, man, you are just living your life completely spent and living just in this rat race of not finding real joy, real meaning real rest and and jesus these are the words of jesus in matthew 11 28 and 29 and jesus says hey come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and again we talked about you know fathers we put pressure on ourselves there's pressure in the family there's pressure with finances and providing there's pressure from society there's pressure from our careers these are heavy burdens these are heavy things that we have to carry. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and carry these heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest, not just for your fatigue, not just rest physically, but rest for your soul. Rest emotionally rest spiritually and and man some of you again you might need a vacation but some of you you just need to come to christ and you need to have him save your soul you need to let him forgive you so you can let go of that burden of of, of guilt and condemnation and and just you know all this this whatever vergüenza, right just just this shame and all this other stuff um, you need to allow him to give you his peace, to, to put his Holy Spirit in your soul. Allow him to teach you the ways of a more balanced life through his word, through his truth. Allow him to lead you and allow him to be your good shepherd. Because we talked, we talked in the beginning that God is a good shepherd. Our father right no that's the lord's prayer my my the lord is my shepherd right the lord is my shepherd i have everything that i need i lack nothing right so last week we talked about i don't i don't have to worry because he's my sustenance he wants to provide and then it says he makes me is he gonna have to make you or are you gonna go ahead and just say all right god I want to lead out. I want to rest. I want to follow you. I want to be led by you. Because some people, man, they, they're, you don't rest unless you're sick. And that's God making you, right? Lie down. So God makes me lie down in green pastures. Then he wants to lead us beside quiet waters. And he wants to refresh our souls. Do we not need that as fathers? Do we not need that as families living in america where everything is go 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 work 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 gang 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 right we need this we need to be able to trust rest is synonymous with trust so again one of the most spiritual things that we can do the, the truth of the matter is that when you rest and you don't feel guilty about it and yeah be responsible come on be wise right it's like i gotta pick up my kids now i'm resting in the lord no go get your kids and then right like no 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 be wise be smart don't be ignorant but we can rest and the truth of the matter is that when we do rest it is such a tangible a tangible and practical way of of worshiping because why because my help comes from the lord he doesn't sleep he doesn't tremble slum, slumber so i can rest in the Lord. Amen.